Later period the Zeppelin albums took a while to grow on me back in high school, except Houses of the Holy, and I had a good reason why. Two words, progressive rock. By early 2001 I was into Led Zeppelin's Classic 4, and of course that was pretty much my playlist. It was during a 5 hour drive to my uncle's house up the country, where I came across an album that would expand the sonic possibilities of rock and roll. My uncle drove his 1982 Land Cruiser and said, open the glove compartment, I've got some cassette tapes. I found two tapes and he said play the one with a skull on the cover. My uncle told me to fast forward this to track number two. And then it happened. It was a sinister tune by the name of Toccata and it changed my life forever. The sounds and rhythms of Emerson and Palmer's brain cell surgery was my introduction to progressive rock. The other tape we listened to in the car? It was Deep Purple's Made in Japan. Talk about a good soundtrack for a long drive, right? And yes, I consider this to be the greatest live rock album of all time. Back at home, I played that ELP tape to death. The three-part suite Carnival 9 was mind-blowing, and I saw a structural connection to classical music. This resonated heavily with me being a classical guitar student at the time. Keith Emerson's keyboard magic had the biggest impact on me since Jimmy Page's guitar. My uncle was a DJ back in the late 70s, and he shared his rock and roll knowledge with me. Little that he knew, he turned his nephew into a music junkie. His holy grail of albums had a huge influence on me. Made in Japan, Santana 3, Led Zeppelin 2, Tubular Rails and Relayer. This last one by Yes became the face of British progressive rock. The first exposure to the Houses of the Holy Material was through the song Remains the Same VHS, which I got in 2002. No Quarter was the song that stood out the most. The mysterious vibes had me wondering, what was it about? This was so far away from the 1969 version of the band, I was fascinated by it. The latter day CD was my second door into Houses. The first time I played it in 2003, I was blown away by the first song. It was a treasure so much different than the movie version. Jimmy's guitar layer sound was massive. The song remains the same was a leap of faith into the world of possible and of course, it had a progressive rock vibe to it with aggressive and creative rhythm changes. Track number two was no quarter and although the guitar solo was a bit short, I was sold. The textures and the mood of the track had me craving for more. This was a Led Zeppelin of more ambitious songwriting and complex arrangements. Track three was Houses of the Holy. I enjoyed this and it reminded me of the theme song for one of my favorite TV series at the time, That 70s Show. I was very much the Eric Foreman type and my dad was, well, he was just like Red Foreman. I wanted to get the Houses of the Holy album. Little that I knew the album's title track was not on the actual record. Weeks later I got my hands on a cheap cassette copy of Remasters Part 2 and I heard the rain song. My first thought was this is better than Stairway to Heaven. I was mesmerized at the beauty of the composition. How can someone come up with this? What was Jimmy thinking? This is brilliant. I figured this one was from Houses of the Holy as it felt like part B of the song remains the same for some reason. It sounded like a progressive rock suite and I was delighted and surprised. Track 3 was familiar. I've heard it on the radio before and John Bonham stole the show on this reggae number by the name of Dire Maker, or so I thought. It took me a couple of years to learn it was pronounced Jamaica. Midway 2003, a local radio station did a special two hour show for the release of How the West Was Won. There it was, Saturday, May 31st, 2003, around 11 pm. This was my shot at recording this on cassette tape, since the 3 CD set was quite expensive, never mind the 5 hour Led Zeppelin DVD. They were in my wish list for many years. So the radio station had a raffle to give away a copy of the brand new album, plus several promotional t shirts among all participants who called in. I was one of them, but of course, I didn't win a thing. The DJ was kind enough to do a small intro and then let the album play with little to no interruptions nor mentioning what song was next. I managed to tape most of it. There I was, at 1am, a teenage guitar player with headphones on, thrilled with each passing minute, not able to share with anybody, no social media, just the music and myself. It was loud, fresh and explosive. I played air guitar in silence and the recording gave me a different angle to the mighty quartet. This was my first time listening to Over the Hills and Far Away dancing days, the ocean and the crunch as that crazy funk jump section in the middle of Days and Confused. I finally got a CD copy of Houses of the Holy in late 2003. An absolute treat of innovative sounds and moments. It had the adventure of Led Zeppelin 3 with some of the bold statements of my British progressive rock favorites like Yes. Besides the music, I had another reason to like this stuff. You see, I have a form of synesthesia in which I see colors in music. More specifically, the guitar fretboard. Each fret has a color. I'm not sure how I assigned these, but it just happened. Over the years, I've understood why album covers and music need to match in my head. 
I can see music and sometimes an album cover can ruin the experience when it doesn't sound the right way. I'll give you an example of my guitar color coding. The third fret is yellow, fourth fret is green, seventh fret is orange. Houses of the Holy has a lot of G major harmonies and chord variations that revolve around the third fret. No quarters tone of C sharp is played on the fourth fret and the ocean's D major voicings are played in triads found on the seventh fret. So you can see why the album cover for Houses of the Holy makes absolute sense to me. Now past the album's good intentions, Houses of the Holy seems to be overlooked in favor of Untitled and Physical Graffiti. Quite unfair indeed, despite its unique sound and composition. Behind the shiny album cover vibes and sales, Led Zeppelin fought silent battles on and off the stage. They had the pressure of a follow-up after Stay With Heaven. They were living in the mainstream shadow of the Rolling Stones, and a musical tragedy happened within the band. The ultimate demise of Robert Plant's high vocal range. By July 1973 in New York, the band gave no quarter to it all. And the cameras captured Led Zeppelin's crowning tour, officially becoming the biggest band of the 70s. Behind their growing popularity, light obstacles, delayed release dates, a busy market and fierce competition, a 1972 concert series that seems to be lost in time, Robert Plant losing his signature high range in less than a year after putting out an iconic album, and Jones, Page and Bonham reaching their live show instrumental peak. The stakes were high and the struggle was real, very real. They faced their fears towards greatness, and in the process we got great songs, new outfits, and the mighty Vistalite. An album that I have eight copies of. The Orange Sounding Record. This is the making of Houses of the Holy. The year was 1971, each member of the band playing with massive amounts of energy and a musical style creating new classic moments in the frenetic fast-paced rhythm of touring. Jimmy Page added the Gibson double neck guitar to his fretboard arsenal. John Paul Jones used his Fender P-Bass attack. His aggressive picking style and increasing keyboard spots made him the band's secret weapon. John Bonham premiered his Ludwig Green Sparkle Kit back in 1970. He perfected his craft of reactionary drumming with new elements like polyrhythms. Robert Plant's 1970 vocals were a glorious display of power and vitality. He recorded the fourth album in full force. He went high and low, raspy and clean, plus everything in between. The band started their 1971 concert runs on March 5th with a legendary show in Belfast where they premiered four tracks from the upcoming album. Going to California, Rock and Roll, Black Dog and Stay With Heaven. The next night in Dublin went well for Robert, however, the first subtle signs of trouble emerged on Black Dog. Plant's voice slightly cracked on the highest notes. Robert got laryngitis at the end of March, forcing the band to postpone their BBC sessions. Their April 1st concert showed Robert was not in top form. His voice was scratchy and hoarse, but managed to give a great performance given the circumstances. He made a spectacular recovery in May in Copenhagen. Plant's voice remained the same until the band's August through September tour of the United States. Robert was excited to sing new material and push his voice to the absolute limit on almost every song. Rock and Roll from August 21st had Plant going wild with some true bone chilling screams in the finale. While the audience was starting to hear this, it was only the beginning of a month-long tour. 
Plan wouldn't get a day off until four days later. This could lead to permanent vocal cord damage. The rest of the 1971 concerts found Robert Plan in vocal lottery results of great, good and okay performances. While he had memorable comebacks, these started to be further apart from each other. The musical landscape of 1971 saw the release of many iconic albums that reflected the impulse of experimentation. The counterculture of progressive rock grew in numbers, walking side by side with established bands at the time. It challenged the listener and added new rhythmical propositions to the legacy of the Woodstock era bands. The instrumental sections behind the vocals grew wiser and daring. Some stated it was the Miles Davis electric band effect or the King Crimson shot in the arm. Whatever the reason, there was a generational green light to go places where record buyers could experience higher levels of creation and reflection. Competition was fierce and many prog bands were very close to their revered masterpieces. Pink Floyd's metal laid the foundations for the stratospheric jump into riches with key tracks One of These Days and Echoes. Genesis' third album and first with Phil Collins and Steve Hackett saw a promising future in the horizon. Or should we say, horizons. Like the Led Zeppelin of 1969, Yes released two albums in a year and their virtuoso sound revolutionized the way rock could be approached with the bass as conductor. Jethro Tull's universe immersed audiences into the mind of Ian Anderson's street gang. They would somewhat ridicule prog rock's lengthy songs on their next record with one long and thick musical statement. Japan became an important destination in the rock and roll circuit. The Ventures were the first band to visit the Eastern stage back in 1964. Acts that followed included the Animals in 65, the Beatles in 66, and the Monkees in 68. By 1971, it was a sign of success, the luxury of travel, and a credential among their peers. The list of performers by then included the names of Blood, Sweat and Tears in February, BB King in March, Free in April, Chicago in June. Grand Funk Railroad in July, who also held the record for selling out Shea Stadium faster than the Beatles, and Pink Floyd in August. Led Zeppelin arrived in September to play five shows. The concerts were recorded at the insistence of the Japanese record company, Warner Bros. Pioneer Corporation, but Page considered the audio quality subpar. The cultural shock of the overpopulated areas of Tokyo left an impression on the band of the power of music as a universal language that brought people together. Jimmy had a portable camera to document his travels at the time. Robert and Bonzo got into a fist fight over gasoline money from 1970. Peter Grant recalled Plant coming off the stage with a split lip. The black country mates were a brotherhood and like a family, walked the tight rope of love and punching themselves in the face. They were a true friendship of challenging each other like the outsiders of Led Zeppelin before joining Page and Jones' well-established London session fame. John Bonham was the ground cable that kept Robert on his toes. The band's first Japanese shows contributed to the growing bootleg market that took over the world of independent releases. Their concerts became holy grails for collectors. Despite having 47 shows under their belt by the time they came back from Japan, Led Zeppelin's upcoming album suffered a major delay in the mixing process. This made the 1971 tours a somewhat wasted opportunity to capitalize on FM radio and musical journalism promoting their new songs. The fourth album could have been ready by May with a possible release date of July to coincide with their US dates. For the first time in their career, they toured without a new product on the shelves. Technically speaking, the 1971 shows of March through September looked like an extension of the tour for Led Zeppelin III. Led Zeppelin's untitled album was finally released on November 8th, 1971. The band played 16 dates in the UK from November 11th through December 21st. A definite collection of hard rock blues and folk attack sent shockwaves throughout the industry. Stay With Heaven, Black Dog and Rock and Roll elevated them into FM royalty. It was their highest selling record of the year, but troubles lied ahead. Based on sales certifications and chart numbers, it was their most commercially successful album of the 70s. None of their works past 1973 managed to sell more than 10 million units in the 70s. Success would haunt Zeppelin's songwriting plans in November 1971. Where could they go from here? Records released that month suggest what the band's next endeavor could be. The sounds were changing and the players had the chops and imagination. Would Led Zeppelin ignore their surroundings and carbon copy their success, or would they accept the creative challenge that was in the air? Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones had the answer. For the first time in Led Zeppelin's pre-production history, both had studio equipment installed at home, which allowed them to work compositions and arrangements beforehand. This saved them headaches down the line and strengthened the songwriting habits to progressive rock terrains where everything was carefully constructed, one bar at a time. 
The fifth album, Centerpiece, is comprised of the Jimmy Page trilogy in G major, three songs that carry much of the weight of the record and act like a small symphony, much in the style of Yes and ELP. Next are songs created as a band or duet. These are more straightforward, but nevertheless can only happen with the kind of chemistry Led Zeppelin had. Last but not least, we have John Paul Jones with the finishing touch that adds balance and finesse, which puts them in the prog rock league with a song that the Genesis lineup of Trespass would have died for. Sessions for Houses of the Holy began with a recording of No Quarter. A composition worked at his home studio in John Paul Jones' finest hour was the second time they attempted to lay down the song on tape. Jones's touring relationship with keyboards had him consistently polish his skills through the delicate touch of Stairway to Heaven and Since I've Been Loving You, plus an organ improvisation leading up to Thank You. An outtake from the Led Zeppelin IV sessions down by the seaside was further proof of things to come featuring John Paul Jones on Hotter Electro Piano. He ran the signal through an EMS VCS3 synthesizer to create the underwater wobble effect. John Bonham used his secret weapon of drumming accents to create a sense of displaced rhythm within a 4x4 framework. He black dogged his way through the composition to great effect. Jimmy's riff seems to be inspired by three references from 1970. His guitar tone on the final mix was achieved in a similar way to Black Dog, running the signal through the mixing console and using the preamp to achieve distortion. Plant's vocals were ran through a chorus filter and its lyrics are derived from the military practice of showing no mercy to the enemy. The song was recorded in D minor with Jimmy Page applying virus speed to drop the whole song a semitone down to C sharp for a thicker sound. Live versions were played in D minor. Paul Jones piano. No Quarter was one of Led Zeppelin's landmark concert tracks, played a total of 124 times, including the 2007 reunion. The song was an instrumental showcase for Jones, Page, and Bonham's onstage telepathy, transforming the piece into an exquisite jam that would extend in the same vein of Days and Confused, with some 1977 versions almost 35 minutes long. 
Jimmy Page used a theremin for the Dogs of Doom effect in response to Plant's vocal delay added to his phrasing. The song made its live debut on May 4th, 1973 during Led Zeppelin's 9th US tour, with Jones using a Fender Rhodes plus a phaser effect. He would add a grand piano from 1975 onwards for added soloing featuring classical musical bits. Page and Plant revisited the song for the 1994 reunion. Their acoustic version was an alternate take and perspective on its magic. Too bad they forgot John Paul Jones' phone number, who performed the track himself on his 2000 and 2001 solo tours. One of the best cover versions of the song was recorded by Tool for their 2000 Saliva release. A great version. You can also check my YouTube channel for a very special 1973 rendition of the song alongside drumming legend the mighty George Flutus from YouTube's Bonomology and People's Front of Zeppelin. <laughs> To as far as your music goes during your concert tour of Australia? We're sort of into a lot of things and try and present what, as much as we can, really. You know, it's not always easy. But um, trying to just give a cross section of what we do and what we've done. That's basically it. We do, we do a little a short acoustic section where we try and uh, show people that we're not a bunch of Aries only, you know. <laughs> The dreadful thing was when we started, there were all these other groups sort of going on, like Black like Sabbath and Grand Funk, and, and everyone was sort of lumping us in with them, mm. for a short while anyway, and then they suddenly realised that there was a bit more to it than just that, you know. At least I hope so anyway. I mean, I know what we're doing, and we all know what we're doing. We, we, the thing is, we, we don't really care about anything else, really, anybody else. Um, I like, I think Stairway to Heaven is the, 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 the epitome, really, of, of what we're up to. That's, that's about the best one. Third LP, Friends. Actually, there's more on the second LP. <laughs> but really, I ought to tell you what I don't like, because there's only about two. Living, Loving, Made about the only one I don't like. And, uh, and apart from that, you know... With the band having four super successful albums around the world, do you reckon it's going to be a problem the next time you're going to record that you'll have in your mind that you've got to top the last album? Yeah, I think that um, if you, taking the four albums, I mean, people have criticised the third album for being far removed from what they expected of it. But if you listen to those four albums, and we go through our trials and tribulations when we, when we uh, write the music, are much greater than any criticism that could ever come along because we would never put in anything out at all that we weren't at all happy with you know so i mean the four albums as a as a whole the whole four put together are such a cross section and i mean every album that we do i mean we've said this a thousand times but it's a fact you know that it's good stuff we know it's good stuff you know otherwise it wouldn't go on the album because we do all sorts of things far removed from even what you've heard so far you know so as far as i think the variation that we've got is quite vast it would have been as easy as anything to carry on the one line for as long as possible you know, and reap the benefit of it. Mm. But I really, you know, I don't, uh, I, I know, I agree with him in, the, in what he says that we're fantastic, you know, but uh, I, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't agree with the, the uh, latter part of it.
got to tell you, we're all sick and bad and poorly. It's amazing we've even been able to stand up, but uh, nevertheless, we're going to rock on. the electricity and water just don't get together at all but we've had a wonderful time and thank goodness you're not in Adelaide good day Led Zeppelin's 1972 Australasian tour was their only visit to Australia and New Zealand from February 16th to the 29th Page visited the same circuit with the Yardbirds in January 1967. The setlist remained pretty much the same as 1971 for Led Zeppelin, with only three cuts from their most recent LP, and the majority of songs from Led Zeppelin 3, including Tangerine. One date for Singapore was cancelled after the authorities refused her entry as their lost band man with long hair. Jimmy Page shaved off his beard of two years after the concert in Melbourne. He would remain clean shaved for the rest of Led Zeppelin's on stage career. His facial hair seems to be his secret weapon. That beard gave us Led Zeppelin 3 and 4. Robert Plant's voice was off to a good start, but his high range was still giving him problems. He began to change the melodies like the final section of Stairway. The band paused their touring schedule to record the rest of the material for the fifth album. Robert's voice began to change. The power in his vocals seems to have lessened and he had a thinner sound.
Platt Page traveled to India at least four times in the space of 12 months. The first of these visits was in early October 1971, right after Led Zeppelin's tour of Japan. The influence of Eastern harmonies and rhythms inspired the cyclical guitar riff of Dancing Days, that Jimmy played on the same open G tuning used on Led Zeppelin's Three That's the Way and on titles Going to California. This would explain why the song was played before Moby Dick on their 1972 shows, as it was easier to go into the drop D tuning after open G and gave enough time to retune the guitar during the drum solo. John Paul Jones played a Farfisa VAP 255 keyboard around the minute and 38 second mark as a harmony layer that complements the guitar work. The 2014 companion disc Rough Mix for Dancing Days with no reverb and no post-production effects allowed the listener to appreciate Jones and Bonham's punch, where the final version is sometimes harsh on the ears due to razor sharp guitar EQ. The Rough Mix is a definite take on the song. The Zeppelin's rhythm bass speaks for itself here. One of the best cover versions was recorded by Stone Temple Pilots for the 1995 In Common Tribute album. It's no surprise their take was successful, as Dancing Days is very proud of grunge itself, a solid effort that brought Zeppelin's music to the audiences of the 90s. Page and Pan performed the song during their 1995 and 1996 runs of the tour. Progressive rock giants Jeff Downs and John Wetton from Asia did their own surprising version for a 2010 tribute release as well. <laughs> Houses of the Holy was a mid-tempo rock song with a trademark Jimmy Page riff in the key of A, plus a prominent use of a cowbell. The lyrics described the concert venue atmosphere where Led Zeppelin performed. Ironically, the song was never played live. The 2014 Rough Mix release of this track is a standout piece. The crunch and heavy attack of Jones and Bonham is a masterclass in rhythm. Maybe a practical joke from the band or not, but they chose not to add this on the final track list for Houses of the Holy and saved it for physical graffiti. Robert Plant performed this track live for his 2010 Band of Joy era shows. Let me take you to the movie. Can I take you to the show? Jump on the on vocals! John Bonham's introductory chant opens the door to this hard rock classic. Led Zeppelin's experiments with odd meter riffing began without in the tiles and was perfected in Black Dog. The ocean takes all the elements from past glories and transforms them into a celebration of rhythm, featuring a main section comprised of a standard 4x4 bar plus a 7-8 segment. Another, 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 another
A small a cappella segment after the guitar solo provides effective tension and release before going back to the groove. While not a direct reference, it is reminiscent of Yes vocal only passages from Fragile as a songwriting tool. The closing section features a duo tribute with the bandmates singing backroom vocals and Bonham playing a 12 by 8 swing groove. Live versions of the song had Jimmy changing some elements from the studio version. The main riff staccato figure was switched to the low string downslide. The guitar solo was played with a wah wah pedal, and despite the track being premiered on the 1972 US tour, Bonzo sang the intro and the middle section harmony until 1973 on their ninth visit to the United States. Controversy exists over the studio version being sped up as Robert Plant's vocals and the crash cymbals sound higher than usual, as opposed to the live versions that in comparison are at least half tone lower. Over the Hills and Far Away was one of the three songs worked out by Jimmy Page at his home studio. The opening motif is reminiscent of the hammer and string attack of Black Mountain Side. The rhythm pattern seemed like a continuation of the vibes of Led Zeppelin III. The chord voicings we see of GA with the bass note of D just before the hard rock section move in the same vein of the intro for the song remains the same. Robert Plant's vocals start off relaxed as preparation to a very demanding high range when the band comes in. The last time he was able to perform the high range vocals was on January 15, 1973 at Stoke, England. Plant was unable to replicate this phrasing from March 73 on and changed the melody for a lower register interpretation. He managed to do a small comeback to the original arrangement on June 13, 1977. Both shows in Epworth 1979 was the last time the band performed the song on stage. Past the catchy chords of the song, the track moves into a guitar solo with a seek of chords D, A and E plus a modulation to F sharp where Jimmy will throw in the solo for Immigrant song plus other licks and ideas. His cue or signal out of the solo was a rhythm section reprised from the verses of Good Times Bad Times from 1969. The band then jumps into a series of 3-4 bars playing a lick in 3 octaves. They come back into the main section through a tricky 2x4 bar that balances the tempo back to the 4x4 groove. This is progressive rock. As they reach the finale, the opening motif is back with displays accents on the two, thus reaching an arpeggio closure to greatness. The Crunch is one of two polarizing tracks from Houses of the Holy, a song that evolved from jamming with Bonham playing a crazy 9-8 beat with Jones joining on bass, for a juxtaposition of James Brown's funk against some danceable shifting time signatures with alternate bars of 4-4, four, 5-8 four, and 2-4 as well. This is progressive funk. The EMS VCS3 synthesizer was played by Jones to emulate horn sounds that were overdubbed separately to create a brass section arrangement. Jimmy plays a Stratocaster guitar for a clean funk sound. The crunch was mostly caught as a live studio jam improvisation that saw its live debut in the middle of Days and Confused during the US tour of 1972. So if you're going to do a film, or going to do a television show, or anything like that, it has to be done properly with a lot of thought, a lot of time, you don't really have the time, you know? Yeah. Jimmy tried to book Hedley Grange for the recording sessions, but it wasn't available. British band Help Yourself was living there after Zeppelin left in early 1971. Their second album, Strange Affair, was written and recorded at Hedley Grange. The band finally left the old mansion in 1973. Because of this, Page settled for Mick Jagger's Star Groves, where The Who had just recorded Who's Next. Their seminal and bombastic studio album left good vibes in the building. The Zeppelin called in engineer Eddie Kramer. Eddie Kramer was a bit surprised to hear from them again, since his last meeting with the band was not pleasant. The year was 1970, and they came in to Electric Ladyland during sessions for Led Zeppelin III. The band trashed the studio. They ordered Indian food and a whole bunch spilled on the floor. When Kramer asked the roadies to clean it up, the band said, you don't tell the roadies what to do. Both sides wouldn't speak to each other for over a year. By the time Zeppelin reached out to Kramer in 72, the band acted as if nothing happened. 